Chapter One of God Died at Three O'Clock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. God Died at Three O'Clock by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. Chapter One The Traitor. One of you will betray me. These words of Jesus Christ cut like a sword into the hearts of the twelve apostles. One of you, you, you. One of the apostles is a traitor. These are terrible words. They are hard to believe. The apostles know that Jesus has enemies. There are men who hate Christ. These enemies would betray him. They would even kill him. But one of the apostles? Never. For three long years the apostles have been Christ's best friends. They have lived with him, eaten with him, helped him in his preaching. During all this time these twelve men have been faithful to him. They have seen Christ give sight to the blind. They have seen him cure the sick and raise the dead to life. Jesus is God. This the apostles know and believe. But now something is wrong. This Thursday night Jesus seems to be very sad about something. Gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem, Christ and his apostles are celebrating the great Jewish feast of the Passover. The supper, it is Christ's last supper, but the apostles do not know this, has gone quite well up to now. The apostles are glad to be here with the master in the upper room. Alone with him, they feel safe and happy. But suddenly, the eyes of the master flash, and from his lips, the awful word, betray, falls like a thunderbolt. One of you will betray me. The apostles are shocked. They can hardly believe it. They stare at one another. Then they whisper together, Which of us can it be? Who is the traitor? Each apostle wonders if he is the guilty one. Is it I, Lord? asked Matthew, his voice trembling. Before Jesus can answer, the others shout the same question. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? The apostles are excited, and Jesus waits for them to be quiet, but his answer does not help them. Jesus does not name the traitor. He does not call him by name. Again he says only that one of the twelve will betray him. This is not enough. It is not enough for Peter, the leader of the apostles. He is angry and wants to know the traitor. The upper room is filled with the noise of excited voices. But Peter signals John to ask Jesus the name of the traitor. John, who is sitting next to Christ, is also anxious to know. Turning, he whispers into the master's ear, Lord, who is it? John waits for Jesus to speak the name of the unfaithful apostle, but the master does not tell it. The name of the faithless apostle is Christ's secret, but he can trust John whom he loves the best. Lord, who is it? John asks again, He it is to whom I shall give bread. John alone hears, and he understands that the traitor's name must be kept a secret. As he speaks, Jesus takes a piece of bread and hands it to Judas. Judas Iscariot, Judas is the traitor. Peter sees Christ pass the bread to Judas, but he does not know what it means. Peter still waits to hear the name of the traitor. A blush on John's cheek tells of the anger in his soul. He feels as though he should accuse Judas openly. Instead, John only stares silently at the apostle, whose name is now Traitor. But Judas does not seem to be excited. He is a good pretender, a fine actor. Is it I, master? He asks, as he takes the bread and begins to eat. Jesus nods his head and answers, Thou hast said it. What you are going to do, do quickly. This answer surprises Judas. It worries him. He is certain now that Jesus knows everything. But Judas has made his evil bargain with Christ's enemies. He has agreed to betray Jesus to them for thirty pieces of silver. He has told no one what he has done. He has kept everything to himself. Yet Jesus knows. Jesus knows the treason of Judas. If only Judas would confess his sin and ask Christ to forgive him. It is not too late if Judas were only sorry. But the heart of the traitor is hardened. 
he hangs his head in stubborn silence. What you are going to do, do quickly. These words of Christ stir the traitor to action. Suddenly he jumps up from the table and hurries out into the night. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of God Died at 3 O'Clock by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese Chapter 2 The Garden The traitor is gone. He will never return to the company of the apostles. For Judas, the last supper will always be an hour of shame. Sadly, Jesus looks on the empty place at the table, the place of Judas. Then he turns his eyes to the other apostles. There are only eleven of them now. Judas is gone. But Jesus still has Peter and Peter's brother, Andrew, and James and John, also brothers. Still faithful to him are Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, and Simon, and two more brothers, Jude and the other James. Christ smiles at these friends, his apostles. These are the men who must build the church, who must carry his story to the ends of the earth. These are the men, poor frightened men, who must suffer in his name. The apostles listen as the master begins to speak to them. First he gives them sorrowful news. Soon, he says, he will leave them, but he will come back. No, the apostles cannot go with him. He is going to his Father in heaven, and he must go alone. Next, Christ warns them of what will happen to them. Because they are his apostles, they will have to suffer many times. But he promises that their sorrow shall be turned into joy, great joy. The apostles are disturbed, and they grow more frightened when Christ tells them that an hour of great danger has come. The apostles need encouragement, and Christ gives it to them. They should not worry too much, he says, about the troubles that the world will bring to them. Have hope, he urges. I have overcome the world. To the apostles, the Master's words are full of mystery. Their minds are weary and confused from trying to understand. At last, Jesus rises. Looking toward heaven, he raises his arms. O oh, Father, he speaks, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. He prays for himself. He prays for the apostles. He prays for the church. The supper is over. It is almost midnight. It is time to go. Jesus leads the way down the narrow steps, and the apostles follow. They do not know where Jesus is going at this hour of the night but they follow the master silently. Jerusalem is asleep, but not Jesus and his eleven apostles. The little group hurries through the streets of the city, and few words are spoken. They pass through the eastern gate and walk along the rough, narrow path that brings them to the brook of Cedron. They cross the bridge and come to a garden of olive trees. A stone wall surrounds the garden. This is the garden of olives. Jesus stops at the gate, he waits for the apostles to gather around him before he speaks. Sit here while I go inside to pray. The apostles are tired. They have walked for almost half an hour, and they are anxious to rest. Without saying a word, the men obey Christ and sit on the ground. Jesus walks through the gate into the garden. He turns and motions to Peter, James, and John to follow him. The three apostles ask no questions. Tonight they want to be close to Jesus. They jump to their feet, walk into the garden, and keep a short distance behind the master. Suddenly, Jesus turns and faces the three men. The soft moon lights his face. He seems very sad. My soul is full of sorrow, he says. Stay here and watch with me. The apostles nod their heads. The sadness of Christ worries them. They wish to talk to him, but the words do not come. Jesus has no need of words from the apostles. They cannot help him. Only he knows the terrible thing that is about to happen, and he must face it alone. Turning away from the three apostles, Jesus walks a little farther into the garden and falls upon his knees in prayer. As he prays, he is seized by a great sorrow. He falls forward on his face, flat to the ground. So awful is this sorrow that even drops of blood trickle down his face. 
Is the strong Christ afraid to die for sinners as he promised? Does some picture of the world's sins rise up before him to sicken his pure soul? What brings this agony to Christ? Jesus is fighting against a great temptation. This is what crushes him with grief. Here in this corner of the Garden of Olives, Jesus thinks about all these people who will never love him. He sees all those sinners who will never care about him. Even though he will offer to forgive them, many sinners will turn their backs on him and walk away. This picture of ingratitude is the thing that is breaking the heart of the good Christ. He has come into the world to die for sinners, but he sees that many sinners will not care very much whether he died or not. Jesus is tempted to flee silently from the garden and leave this world of cold hearts to take care of itself. But he fights against this temptation. He prays to his father to take away this terrible thought, but only if it is his father's will. He staggers to his feet and comes to the three apostles. They are asleep. Peter awakes to hear the master ask him, Can you not watch one hour with me? Now James and John are also awake. They see Christ's tired face, marked with the bloody lines of suffering. They wonder. Pray that you do not enter into temptation, says Christ to the three, as he turns and walks slowly back to the place where he has been praying. Soon the apostles drop into sleep again. Here in the moonlit garden, only Jesus is awake, suffering and praying, Father, not my will, but your will be done. A second time Jesus comes to find the apostles asleep, and they are too ashamed to speak to him. Leaving them, Christ returns to prayer and offers his life for all sinners. Once more, Peter, James, and John awake to find Christ standing before them. He is strong and calm again, but the apostles hear noises on the road leading to the garden. They see lights moving through the darkness, and they are afraid. Who comes at this hour to the garden? they ask. He who will betray me is here, answers Jesus, and he watches as the lights, bringing the traitor, come closer to the garden. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of God Died at Three O'Clock » by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. The Kiss Time stands still in the Garden of Olives as Jesus and his apostles wait for the traitor. They see the torchlights grow brighter and they hear the sound of tramping feet grow louder. The traitor is not coming alone. He brings with him a band of followers. Jesus walks closer to the entrance of the garden. Peter feels the sword hidden beneath his cloak. He grips it tightly and draws nearer to the master. The noisy mob bursts into the garden. Soldiers, servants of the high priest, men from the streets. Some carry lanterns and torches. Others wave swords and sticks and clubs. Now they stop before Christ and his apostles. The men stare as if they are surprised to find anyone here at this hour. But why do they come? Who sends them? Jesus steps forward to speak the first word. His voice is calm and firm. Whom do you seek? He asks. Jesus of Nazareth, calls out the men. Jesus answers quickly, I am he. At these words the men stagger and fall back, as if struck by a mighty blow. Slowly the mob draws together again. As boldness returns to them, one man suddenly steps forth from their midst. Peter's eyes flash. The smiling figure who now steps in the crowd toward the master is Judas. Hail, master, he says as he throws his arms around Christ and kisses him. This kiss is the kiss of a traitor. It is the traitor signal to these men who have come for Jesus with swords and clubs. Now the men know that Jesus is the one whom Judas has greeted with a kiss. At once there is an uproar. The men crowd around Christ. They seize him quickly, thinking he will try to escape. But they are mistaken. Jesus does not try to escape. He does not try to run away. He stands silently and faces his enemies with courage. As these angry men press around Jesus, Peter wonders what he can do to save Christ. 
if peter attacks this mob alone he will be quickly overpowered and perhaps killed but he might be able to hold back the crowd long enough to give jesus a chance to get away this is a bold plan it means that peter may be killed but to save christ peter will risk it pulling out his sword he strikes swiftly at the man nearest to the master a servant of the high priest the blow is wild and cuts off the servant's right ear but peter's wave attempt is quickly stopped put away your sword christ commands him don't you know he goes on kindly if i would ask my father he would send angels to help me peter does not answer he is puzzled he draws back from the crowd and covers his sword Jesus then steps toward the wounded servant and touches the side of his face. At once the blood stops running and the wound is healed. This act of kindness does not change the feelings of the mob. Many times before Christ has worked miracles and has been hated. These men, too, still hate him, and they do not allow this new miracle to soften their hearts. Jesus knows that it is useless to argue, but he raises his hand and asks a question. Am I a robber? Why, then, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me? I sat daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not lay hands on me. Now the man dares to answer. They are afraid to answer, because Jesus speaks the truth. For several moments there is silence, and then some of the men begin to grumble. Others wave their clubs in the air and push closer to Christ. Where are the apostles? Gradually they have drawn away from Christ and are now standing at the edge of the crowd. They pity Christ, but they are shaking with fear. They see that Christ cannot escape, and they are afraid that his enemies may also seize them. They are in danger, and they must act quickly. While the mob crowds and pushes around Christ, the apostles run fearfully into the olive grove and disappear in the darkness. Christ is alone. His friends have run away. He is the prisoner of a wild and angry mob. Christ's hands are tied with a rope. His enemies handle him roughly. But Jesus does not complain. The men lead Jesus from the garden and start for the city of Jerusalem. God is now the prisoner of men. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of God Died at Three O'Clock » by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Peter Weeps Jerusalem, the great city of the Jews. Here Christ has preached often and worked many miracles. Here in this same city, only a few days ago, the people gave him a royal welcome and shouted that they wanted him to be their king. Things are different now as Christ's enemies lead him bound through the quiet streets. The city is cold and dark on this Thursday night. Once more Jerusalem receives Jesus, this time not in glory but in shame. At the home of Annas, the guards turn in and Jesus follows them. At one time Annas had been the high priest, and even yet he is a man of power among the Jews. Caiaphas, his son-in-law, is the high priest now, and together they have plotted the death of Jesus. Annas is hard and cruel, a man without mercy. He seems pleased to see Christ standing as a prisoner before him. "'Tell me what you have taught,' Annas says roughly to Jesus. "'Why do you ask me?' replies the prisoner calmly. "'Ask them who have listened to me. They know what I said.' Christ is still the master, and the wicked old Annas is stung by the prisoner's words. Annas knows what Christ means. Annas must prove that Christ has done wrong. He must bring forth witnesses. Has anyone seen Christ do anything wrong? Christ dares Annas to prove it. Christ is demanding a trial. Jesus is ready to face a trial, but Annas is not ready. Annas is not the high priest. He has no power to call the judges. He orders the guards to take the prisoner to Caiaphas. As Annas walks away, he knows that it will not be easy to condemn Jesus to death. Christ does not expect any fairness in the house of Caiaphas. The high priest is the chief judge in this trial where Christ's life is at stake. 
but the high priest is also Christ's chief enemy. It was he who gave the order to arrest Jesus, and already Caiaphas has told the other judges that the teacher of Nazareth must die. Now the judges of Jerusalem are gathered in the palace of the high priest, and the trial of Jesus begins. Caiaphas is in control. He is not looking for the truth as a judge ought to do. He is a murderer seeking blood. He calls upon witnesses to tell what they know about Christ, and they all speak lies. Some say that Jesus breaks the law. Others say that he is the friend of sinners. Still others claim that he works for the devil. These men speak the lies that Annas and Caiaphas had taught them. During this evil trial, Jesus stands before Caiaphas and the other judges with his head bowed. He is a sad figure, and he says nothing. Even when they lie about him, Jesus does not answer. It is useless to argue here. Jesus only listens and suffers in silence. But the silence of Jesus worries Caiaphas, and the lies worry the judges. If the judges are to condemn Christ to death, Caiaphas feels he must make the prisoner speak. Standing in his place, the high priest faces Jesus. Have you nothing to say? he asks, and his voice is angry. Jesus does not answer. His judges have not been able to find anything wrong in him, and Jesus refuses to argue against lies. The prisoner's silence makes the high priest very angry. Tell us, he demands, are you the Christ, the Son of God? This question breaks the silence of Jesus. I am, he answers calmly. Caiaphas pretends to be shocked at Christ's claim to be the Son of God. He turns to the other judges. Do they not believe that Christ has insulted God? he asks. Do they not believe that Christ must be put to death? The judges nod their heads gravely. The prisoner, they agree, is guilty of death. Seeing that the judges hate Christ so bitterly, the guards now treat their prisoner with great cruelty. They blindfold Jesus and then strike him with their hands. Others mock him, make fun of him, and even spit in his face. Jesus can do nothing to defend himself. His hands are tied. He suffers the blows and insults of his guards without speaking a word. The evil Caiaphas now plots his next step against Christ. The judges have condemned Jesus to death, but Caiaphas cannot carry out this order unless Pilate, the Roman governor, allows it. So Caiaphas orders the guards to hold the prisoner until morning, when he will be brought before Pilate. While Caiaphas has worked for the death of Christ, a crowd has gathered in the courtyard of his palace. Here servants and a few strangers warm themselves near a fire. Among them is one friend of Jesus. It is the Apostle Peter. Still hopeful that his master may escape, Peter has slipped into the courtyard to see what will happen. But the servants recognize Peter as a friend of the prisoner. First one accuses him, then another. Each time the fearful Peter denies that he knows Christ. Then a third servant accuses Peter of being a follower of Christ. Angrily, Peter declares that he does not know the man. At this moment, Peter looks up to see the sad face of Jesus looking at him. Peter has denied his master. Like Judas, he, too, is a traitor. Shocked by what he has done, Peter hurries from the courtyard of Caiaphas. Alone outside, Peter begins to weep for having denied Jesus. But through his tears, the sorry apostle sees hope. Jesus will forgive. Jesus will always love Peter. End of chapter 4。Chapter 5 of God Died at Three O'Clock by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Pilot. Friday morning dawns in the city of Jerusalem. Ever afterward, this day will be called Good Friday. But now one sees no good in it, only evil, for this Friday is the day which Caiaphas has set for the death of Christ. After his unfair trial in the palace of the high priest, Jesus spent the night under close guard. It was a sleepless night for him. 
It was a sleepless night for Christ's enemies, too. They spent the dark hours planning for their prisoner's death. One thing, however, still stands in the way of Caiaphas and his friends. They must have the consent of Pilate, the governor. Will Pilate allow Christ to be put to death? Caiaphas knows that it will not be easy to win Pilate's permission, but the high priest has plans to force the governor to agree with him. Early on this Friday morning, Jesus is brought a second time before Caiaphas and the judges. They will question this prisoner again before taking him to Pilate. Are you the Christ? is the first question of the judges. The tired Jesus raises his head. If I tell you, he answers, you will not believe me. Why do they ask him questions? They do not want to hear the truth. This is what Christ means. His judges understand, but hatred has blinded them. Are you the Son of God? they ask next. Jesus looks straight at the judges. I am, he answers firmly. Jesus says that he is God. This is just what Caiaphas and the judges want him to say. He must die, cry the judges. They have made up their minds. Christ must die. He must die today. Caiaphas and his followers lose no time. They bind Jesus tightly with ropes. There must be no chance of his friends rescuing him as he is led through the streets to Pilate's palace. Caiaphas himself leads the procession of prisoner, guards, and followers into Pilate's courtyard. A message is sent in to the Roman governor, and soon the haughty Pilate appears on the balcony to face the crowd. Of what do you accuse this man? he asks. He is an enemy of our nation, calls out the crowd. He says he is Christ, a king. Pilate turns, looks at Christ, and wonders. If this man is a king, why is there no one here to defend him? Where are his armies? Where are his friends? Is it possible that this prisoner standing here is a man of power? Why does this crowd hate the prisoner? There is something here that Pilate cannot understand. He must talk with Jesus alone. He goes back into his palace and orders Jesus to be brought in to him. Caiaphas and his followers wait outside in the courtyard. Face to face with Jesus, the governor asks him a question. Are you the king of the Jews? You say that I am, is the prisoner's answer. Pilate is impatient. Will not Jesus defend himself? Has Jesus tried to make himself king of the Jews? Pilate appeals to him to explain what he has done. Yes, Jesus is a king. This he admits to Pilate. But Jesus is not an ordinary king. My kingdom, he tells the governor, is not of this world. Now Pilate is worried. This prisoner surely is innocent. He plots no revolt against the emperor. But what about Caiaphas and the crowd outside? The governor takes the prisoner with him to the balcony to face Christ's accusers. I find this man guilty of no crime, declares Pilate in a strong voice. He hopes that this will end all the trouble. Let the prisoner be freed and let the Jews go away. But the crowd is angry at Pilate's words. It refuses to move. Pilate's sharp eye looks for signs of trouble. How can he save his pride without giving in to the enemies of Christ? Then an idea comes to him. Is this man from Galilee? Pilate asks the crowd. Yes, the leader shout back. And he should be judged by Herod, the ruler of Galilee. Caiaphas and the leaders of the Jews have forgotten about Herod, who is now visiting in Jerusalem. The ruler of Galilee is a fearful king. He wants no king but himself. He should be very ready, thinks Caiaphas, to condemn Jesus who claims to be a king. King Herod has heard about Jesus. He is worried when he heard men talk about making the teacher of Galilee a king, even king of the Jews. Herod has heard much, too, about the many miracles which Jesus has performed. For a long time the king of Galilee has hoped to meet Jesus. Now he smiles when Jesus is led before him. Christ stands a sad and sorry figure, and bound with ropes. Can this prisoner be the rival for his throne? Herod laughs at his own fears. But this is the Jesus, Herod remembers, 
who has performed so many a wonderful miracle. Perhaps he will show Herod a miracle? Herod urges the prisoner to show his power and asks him many questions. But Jesus remains silent and refuses to speak to the king. Jesus wishes to be a king of the Jews, says Caiaphas, and urges Herod to condemn him to death. The ruler laughs. No, he will not condemn Christ. He will send the prisoner back to Pilate, but dressed as a king. Herod and his soldiers clothe Jesus in a white robe. They make Jesus a mock king. The king of Galilee laughs at the king of heaven, but the king of heaven is silent as he turns away to go back to Pilate. End of chapter 5「six of God died at three o'clock by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Crucify him. Pontius Pilate had been the Roman governor of Palestine for many years. He is a hard ruler, and at times he is very cruel. But always he has a secret worry, the fear that the Jews may turn against him. If this should happen, the emperor in far-off Rome might take away Pilate's governorship. Pilate worries because the Jews demand that Christ be put to death. He believes that Jesus is innocent, but Caiaphas and the chief leaders of the Jews are very determined on Christ's death. If Pilate will not give in to them, they may plot against him. Jesus says that he is a king. The Jews, if refused Christ's death, might tell the emperor that Pilate is protecting a new king. This would mean the end of Pilate. Now the Jews and their prisoner have returned to his courtyard. Pilate is disappointed. He had hoped that King Herod would settle the problem of Jesus, but that ruler is too clever to get himself caught in this dangerous affair. Pilate knows that it is up to him to deal with Jesus. On him alone will fall the praise or blame for whatever happens to the prisoner. Standing on the balcony, Pilate once more listens to the crowd shouting for Christ's death. Their angry cries frighten the governor, but finally he raises his hand for silence. You accuse this man of many things, he says as he points his finger toward Christ, but he is not guilty of the things of which you accuse him. He is innocent and should not be put to death. Therefore, I will punish him and let him go. If Jesus is innocent... Why should he be punished? Pilate hopes this may satisfy the hatred of the crowd, but harsh voices cry out against Pilate's proposal. The crowd is stubborn. It wants the prisoner to be put to death. At this desperate moment, Pilate has a new idea. He remembers that the Jews have a custom of freeing a prisoner each year at this time. He thinks quickly. To his mind comes a terrible name. Barabbas. Barabbas, a robber and a murderer, is now in prison waiting to be put to death. The people of Jerusalem know this Barabbas well and are afraid of him. Now Pilate knows what he will do. He will save Christ yet. He will win over this angry crowd. Let the crowd choose between Christ and Barabbas. Surely, thinks the governor, the crowd will choose Christ. It is time for you to free a prisoner, he calmly tells the crowd. Whom shall I free, Jesus or Barabbas? The Jews are taken by surprise. Has this clever Roman tricked them? How can they choose to free such a villain as Barabbas? What if they do not free Barabbas? Then Christ will escape. Caiaphas and the chief leaders of the people act quickly. They move through the crowd, giving orders. Pilate waits impatiently for the crowd to choose between Christ and Barabbas. Whom shall I free? he asked again. The Jews shout their decision. Give us Barabbas! Pilate is shocked. Once again, Caiaphas, the high priest, holds the upper hand. Barabbas, the robber, the murderer! The crowd wants Barabbas to be free. This mob has chosen the evil Barabbas over the innocent Christ. What, then, shall I do with Jesus? asked Pilate nervously. Quickly, loud voices from the crowd roar back. Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate's fight to save Christ is lost. The angry crowd, led by Caiaphas, has won. Pilate has tried to save Christ. 
He has tried all means and has failed. If he were a brave man, he could save Christ even now. One word from Pilate, and Christ would be free. But Pilate is a coward. He fears the anger of Caiaphas and the Jews. He is afraid of what his emperor might think. But before the sad eyes of Christ, this proud Roman is ashamed of his own weakness. Turning to one of his men, the Roman governor orders some water to be brought to him. When the servant brings the water, Pilate washes his hands before the crowd. I am innocent, he says, of the blood of this just man. The Jews laugh at Pilate's silly gesture. They stand ready to accept all blame for the death of Christ. Let his blood, they cry, be upon us. Crucify him, crucify him. End of chapter 6「7 of God died at three o'clock by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. The Man of Sorrows. The sorrowful Christ listens to the crowd calling for his death. He is used to crowds. For three years he has walked among these men doing good, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, raising the dead to life. Everywhere during these three years people followed after him. They saw him prove by his miracles that he is God. Many times they were ready to offer him a ruler's crown. Only a few days ago they wanted to set him upon the throne of a king. But things are different on this Friday morning. Today the crowd surrounding Jesus is mean and hateful. Today the men who once cheered him forget his many kind deeds and words of love. Now the crowd hates its hero and wishes to raise him upon a criminal's cross. Christ is led into the courtyard of the palace. His cloak is removed and he is tied to a post. At a signal from the guards, the crowd moves back, leaving plenty of space, and four Roman soldiers step forward. Each soldier holds a short wooden club, to which are fastened several pieces of leather. On the end of each strip of leather is a small piece of lead. Jesus looks at the soldiers and glances at their whips. He knows what is coming. In his heart he prays, for the soldiers, for the crowd, for Pilate, for the world. Two of Pilate's guards move closer to Christ. Cruelty comes easily to these Roman soldiers. Raising their arms, they lash their whips upon the bare back of Christ. They strike each blow with all their power and strength, so that the leaden ends of their whips cut deeply into the prisoner's flesh. Soon Christ's body is flaming red and covered with cuts. The blood from his wounds trickles to the ground. When the first two soldiers tire, two others take their place. This whipping lasts for some minutes. The law allows only a certain number of blows upon a man condemned to death, but the Roman soldiers pay no attention to the law in their dealings with Christ. Each blow strikes with deadly force upon the prisoner who has no friend at Pilate's palace. Jesus stands at the post and suffers the blows in silence. Not once does he cry out against his enemies or beg for mercy. He knows that his Father in heaven is watching. Christ is suffering for the sins of the world. Already he has taught men how to live. Now he teaches them how to suffer. At last the soldiers finish their cruel work and throw down their whips. How does Jesus live after such a terrible beating? The soldiers wonder. They have seen men die under such a beating. Jesus is now truly a man of sorrows. He is weak, very weak, but somehow he manages to remain on his feet. Blood covers his face and flows freely from his open wounds, and his whole body aches, and this is only the beginning of his sufferings. There is still the cross. The Roman soldiers stare at the suffering Christ. His flesh is torn to shreds. His body is drenched with blood. He is too weak even to raise his head. Can this be the man who claims to be a king? Can this prisoner be the king of the Jews? The soldiers laugh and jeer at the thought. Then they see a chance for more cruel sport. A king should wear a royal robe. A king should wear a crown. He should carry a scepter in his hand as a sign of his kingship. The Jews have refused to make Christ their king. 
but now the Roman soldiers will make him the king of the Jews. One soldier brings a scarlet cloak. This is Christ's royal robe. Now comes the crown. Heavy thorns are quickly twisted into a crown. This is placed on the head of Jesus, and the sharp thorns press painfully into his brow. Then a reed is placed in his hand. This is meant to be his scepter. The soldiers smile and think of Caesar, their emperor, who carries a scepter of gold. The Romans have not yet completed their evil joke. Kings should be given worship and homage. So they honor Jesus with cowardly blows on the face. They spit on him. They shout insults. Hail, King of the Jews! The Romans jeer and bow their knees in mockery before Jesus. Hail, King of the Jews! These soldiers of Rome are pagans. They do not believe in the true God. This Jesus, whom they insult, is the Son of God. They mock him as a king. They do not know that he truly is a king, the king of kings, the king of heaven and earth. They do not know that one day his name will be the greatest name in their proud city of Rome and all the world. But what about Caiaphas and the chief leaders of the Jews? Are they blind to this Christ who is now a man of sorrows? Under the blows and the blood and the bruises, do they not see who Christ really is? Long ago, as a boy, Caiaphas learned about the Savior of the world. He studied the words of Isaiah the prophet. Long before this day, Isaiah foretold how Christ would be hated by men, how he would be a man of sorrows. Isaiah told how the Savior of the world would be wounded, bruised, and put to death. All these things Caiaphas and the leaders of the Jews know. But now they forget. Today they kill the man of sorrows. End of chapter 7、Chapter 8 of God Died at Three O'Clock by Rev. e r e n Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Caesar Wins. No one has tried to save Jesus from the cruel hands of the soldiers, not even Pilate. But the governor is unhappy, worried, and afraid. Jesus has done nothing wrong. This Pilate still believes, but he has allowed Christ to suffer. His own soldiers punished Christ, and he did nothing to stop them. Inside his palace, Pilate now meets the man of sorrows face to face. Pilate stares at the swollen face, the crown of thorns, and the scarlet cloak partly hiding the wounded body. The sight of the wounded Christ moves the cold heart of the Roman governor. Will it also soften the angry hearts of the Jews? Will Christ's enemies be satisfied now? Pilate hopes. Once again, Pilate brings Christ before the Jews, and he looks at their faces for some sign of a change of heart. He sees none. Look at this man, cries Pilate in a voice that almost pleads for the crowd to have pity. The crowd, however, has no pity. Crucify him! Crucify him! they call back. Pilate's face pales. His weak effort has failed. How can he argue any more? Take him, then, and crucify him. I find him guilty of no crime. Pilate is angry with the crowd and angry with himself because he knows he is a coward. The high priest and his followers are ready to take all blame for putting Jesus to death. But why, they wonder, should the Roman governor be so afraid? Why has Pilate tried so hard to save the prisoner? This man ought to die, they tell Pilate, because he says he is the Son of God. The Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. This prisoner is God. The thought strikes new fear into Pilate's heart. All morning his mind has been bothered by fear of the emperor, fear of Caiaphas, fear of the Jews. Now comes fear of God. The frightened Pilate must have one more word alone with Jesus. Fearful and ashamed, the governor brings the prisoner into the hall of the palace. Looking upon Jesus, Pilate tries to think. Who is this prisoner? Is he only a poor man from Galilee? Is he from heaven? Is this Jesus only another troublemaker? Or is he the Son of God? Who is this prisoner who stands so silently before him? Pilate asks questions, but Jesus remains silent. Don't you know? 
asked the worried governor, that I have the power to crucify you? Don't you know that I have the power to set you free? Now Jesus has an answer. His sad, swollen eyes look straight into the frightened eyes of the Roman ruler. You would not have any power against me unless it were given to you by God. He who gave me up to you is guilty of the greater sin. Christ's answer only frightens Pilate all the more. He cannot understand the strange prisoner who stands before him. Already Jesus has been punished and is now in danger of death, yet he does not try to defend himself. Other prisoners beg for mercy, but this man is calm, unafraid. Leaving Jesus in the palace, Pilate goes back to the crowd standing outside. Once more he argues with the Jews and tries to win mercy for Christ. But the Jews have made up their minds. They will not listen. They know that they have Pilate trapped. If you free this man, they warn Pilate, you are no friend of Caesar's. Caesar, the Roman emperor. Pilate fears his emperor. If he frees Jesus, the Jews will go to Caesar. This is the threat that they make to Pilate, and their warning works. Pilate fears the anger of Caesar. He will not risk himself any more. He orders the soldiers to bring Jesus before the crowd. Look at your king, says Pilate when Jesus appears again. The crowd looks at Christ. They see a man who has been half beaten to death, but there is no pity in their hearts. Away with him, they cry. Crucify him. The Roman governor waits for them to quiet down. Shall I crucify your king? He sneers angrily at the crowd. This time Caiaphas and the leaders of the Jews step forth to answer Pilate. We have no king but Caesar. Again that name of Caesar. Pilate must choose between Christ and Caesar. There is no doubt now what Pilate will do. Earlier this morning Pilate forced the Jews to choose between Christ and Barabbas. To his surprise, they chose Barabbas. Now the Jews have the upper hand. They are forcing Pilate to choose between the man of sorrows and the emperor of Rome. Because he is a coward, Pilate must choose the emperor. Caiaphas and the Jews know that they have won at last, but they wait for Pilate to give the final command that will send Jesus to death. Pilate looks at Jesus and hesitates before speaking. Then the governor speaks quickly, as if he were ashamed of his own voice. You must go to the cross. End of chapter 8、chapter 9 of God Died at Three O'Clock by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. His mother. You must go to the cross. The Son of God must die like a criminal. He will be nailed to a cross. Jesus hears the cruel words of Pilate, but says nothing. Closing his eyes, Jesus sees the happenings of the past three years flash through his mind. He sees the ten lepers whom he cured, the dead man whom he brought back to life, the five thousand whom he fed by a miracle, the blind beggar to whom he gave sight. He sees himself entering Jerusalem while the people cheer and call him a king. Where are all these people today? Now Christ is friendless. Now he is only enemies. Alone and hated, he stands a prisoner, condemned to death. Jesus is willing to die. He is willing because it is his Father's wish. Jesus finds no fault with the sentence of death. There is no hatred in his heart. Instead, he pities Pilate. He is sorry for his enemies, Caiaphas and the Jewish leaders. Jesus stands in the courtyard, ready and waiting for the cross. In a few minutes, two of the soldiers step forward and take the scarlet cloak from Christ's shoulders. Then the prisoner is given back his own clothes. He covers his wounded and bleeding body with a journey to death. Now the crowd is anxious to see the end. The day is growing warm, and the slight delay makes many impatient. Suddenly the crowd is silent. Every eye turns from Christ to watch the soldiers dragging out a heavy cross. The soldiers push their way through the crowd and lay the cross upon the ground at Christ's feet. Jesus looks at this evil cross and says nothing. Soon he will be nailed to this cross. Soon he will die upon it in shame. 
but this ugly cross of shame will also be Christ's sign of victory. Long after his death, this cross will stand in every corner of the world. This cross will be the sign of hope and joy to all men. The cross of Christ will preach hatred for sin and love for God. The story of the cross will be the story of God's love for the world. The soldiers place the cross upon Christ's shoulders. It is a heavy load for a weak man to carry, but Jesus manages the load without help. He follows the soldiers and guards as they lead him through the streets of Jerusalem. The city is crowded with visitors. Men, women, and children stand in the narrow streets to watch the strange procession. Some of the people sneer, others laugh, a few wonder. Who is this man who carries the cross? What wrong has he done? Many times Jesus has walked through these same city streets. He knows them well. He knows every shop. He knows every corner. Now he is walking through Jerusalem for the last time. Each step brings him closer to Calvary, the gloomy place outside the city walls where criminals are put to death. Jesus staggers slowly under the heavy cross. He has come only a short distance on his sorrowful journey. Now he stumbles and falls flat to the ground, weak and exhausted. He lies still in the dirt of the road. The crowd shouts and laughs and urges him to get up, for the cross is too heavy. Jesus tries to rise, but the cross holds him down. The soldiers lift the cross, and Jesus gets slowly to his feet. They give him no chance to rest. Once again, the cross is placed upon his shoulders. Tired, weak, and dizzy from hunger and thirst, and the whipping he has had, Jesus stumbles on with his heavy load. Now and then, Christ glances at the people who line the streets. He searches through blood-filled eyes for one kindly face. But these faces staring at him show mostly hate. Some show scorn, some show fear, only a few show pity. At the corner of a narrow alley, Jesus halts his slow and painful steps. At last he sees before him some friendly figures. Standing in the street is his mother Mary. With her are his apostle John and other friends. Mother and son... It is a bitter meeting for both of them. Mary is losing Christ. The soldiers are taking him away to death. What will the mother and son say to each other? What can they say? Mary does not speak. Neither does Christ. Each knows the thoughts of the other. They need no words. They speak only with their eyes, only with their hearts. The soldiers push Christ onward. Again, he seems to lose his balance and almost falls. But somehow he is able to steady himself. He is losing strength rapidly, and the soldiers watch him closely. Will their prisoner be able to reach Calvary? Will he die in the street and cheat the cross? If Christ is to be saved for death on Calvary, someone must help him carry the cross the rest of the way. He is too weak now to carry it alone. The soldiers look at the crowd along the road. Who will help Christ carry his cross? No Jew wants to share the shame. Certainly no Roman. One of the guards sees a man standing in the crowd, whose clothes show that he is not a Jew, neither is he a Roman. This stranger is Simon from Cyrene in North Africa. Simon has come to Jerusalem on a visit, and today he has been drawn by curiosity to watch the man carrying the cross. So Pilate's soldiers seize this Simon of Cyrene, they drag him roughly out of the crowd and order him to help Jesus with the cross. But Simon refuses. He argues. He has done no wrong. Why then should he be treated like a criminal? Why should he carry a cross through the streets of Jerusalem? Why should he suffer in shame? The soldiers do not argue with the stranger. They force him to carry the cross upon which Christ will die. Simon of Cyrene walks in shame behind Christ. But some day Simon will be proud of this honor, proud that he was chosen to walk in the blood-stained footsteps of Jesus Christ on this Friday morning. When this day is ended, only Simon, the stranger, can boast, I carried the cross of Christ. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of God died at three o'clock. Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Veronica. 
It is late morning, and the warm sun beats heavily upon the man with the cross. Every step is one of agony. The heavy cross, even though Simon helps with it, cuts his shoulders and makes him ache with pain. His face is dirty, his eyes swollen and red, and the crown of thorns digs deeply into his tender skin. Jesus Christ is a sad picture, suffering as no other man ever suffered. But he struggles on toward Calvary. He begs for no mercy. He expects no mercy. He walks through the streets with a prayer in his heart, a prayer that his father will give him strength to finish the journey to Calvary. Most of the people who watch the suffering Christ seem cold-hearted. Only a few in the crowd feel sorry for him. Some of the women cannot bear the sight of the man of sorrows and turn away their heads. Others weep silently and want to help, but they are afraid. But there is one woman in the crowd who is not afraid. Her name is Veronica. Veronica sees Jesus and her heart goes out to him. Her first thought is to help, but what can she do? In an instant a thought flashes through the woman's mind. Veronica forgets about the crowd. She forgets the soldiers and guards. She sees only Christ. Leaving the crowd, Veronica rushes into the street. She wipes Christ's blood-stained face with a white cloth. The guards shout angrily. They treat Veronica roughly and push her aside. The procession moves forward. Veronica, with tears in her eyes, watches Jesus disappear down the narrow street. As she turns to enter the house, she opens her cloth, and there on the cloth is a picture. It is the face of Christ. Then Veronica remembers that Jesus did not speak to her, but her piece of cloth is proof of his thanks for her act of kindness. The procession passes through the city gate and moves into the open country. It draws near Calvary. The way of the cross is almost finished. Once again Jesus stumbles and falls, but he does not remain on the ground very long. The soldiers pull him to his feet, push him, and urge him not to delay. Some of the women, feeling that the soldiers are too cruel, cry out against them. But the soldiers pay no attention to them. Jesus, however, is grateful. He knows that the women pity him, and he knows, too, that his sufferings are making them suffer. Turning to them, Jesus speaks kindly. Do not weep for me, he says. Weep for yourselves and for your children. What does Christ mean? Why should the women weep for themselves? Why should they weep for their children? Will the city of Jerusalem be cursed for this terrible day? Will God punish Jerusalem for the death of Christ? The women of Jerusalem wonder and continue to weep, and Christ passes on. As the procession draws near Calvary, the crowd becomes less noisy. They are tired from the walk in the hot sun. Christ, too, is tired. His feet and back are sore. His body is feverish and numb with pain. At last, Jesus reaches the small rocky mound of Calvary. Slowly he struggles to the top. The journey of the cross is over. Here on Calvary, Jesus stands waiting to offer his life for the sins of the world. Death will be a welcome escape for this tired man of sorrows. His death on the cross will be a sacrifice, a payment for the sins of the world. But already he has suffered so much. Even before reaching Calvary, Jesus has paid a costly price for the sins of men. Both Jews and Romans have raised their hands and voices against him. Women, as well as men, have called for his death. Kings and servants, rich and poor, have mocked him and laughed at him. Even his friends have caused him to suffer. Judas has betrayed him. Peter has denied him. Other friends have deserted him. His body has been torn and beaten with a cruel lash. His head has been crowned with thorns. His face has been soiled with blood. In shame and weakness, Christ has looked through swollen eyes to see the tears of his mother. Next will come the nails in his hands and his feet, the cross. This is the price of sin, the sins of the world. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of God Died at Three O'Clock by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. On the Cross Christ has come to Calvary to die because Caiaphas, the high priest, has plotted against him. Here on Calvary, the rough Romans act quickly and quietly. 
four of Pilate's men stand near Christ and watch as the crowd comes closer. At a signal from their leader, the soldiers raise the wooden cross and place it in a hole. Then they shovel rocks and dirt into the hole, stamping it down around the foot of the cross. The cross, firmly fixed in the ground, stands tall, a dark and ugly thing against the sky. Calvary's cross is ready, and in its shadow stands Jesus Christ. The angry arms of the cross are waiting for the Son of God. Now, without a word, the soldiers rip the clothes from Christ's shoulders. This tears the wounds of his body open, and the blood flows freely again. The body of Christ throbs with the most terrible pain, but the prisoner does not complain. Some of the women turn their heads. They cannot stand the sight of blood. They wish now that they had not come. Death on a cross is not an easy thing to watch. For thirty-three years Jesus has been walking toward Calvary. He takes his last four steps and stands at the foot of the cross. It is noon, Friday noon. The world can never forget this dark hour. The soldiers tie ropes around the arms and body of Christ, and they throw the ends of the ropes over the beams of the cross. Then they pull on the ropes, and so lift the body up against the cross and fasten it there. But this is not all. The soldiers climb ladders and drive nails through Christ's hands into the arms of the cross. The pounding of the nails sounds across Calvary. There is a death-like stillness on the rocky hill, a stillness broken only by the pounding hammers. Some of the people shudder and shake their heads. The soldiers come down from their ladders. Two of them brace the cross from behind, while others drive nails through Christ's feet. It makes no difference to the soldier that they are making Christ suffer. For them, it is a job to be done. While the rough soldiers drive the nails into Christ's feet, Jesus raises his head and prays aloud, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The soldiers hear the words, but they pay no attention. Placing a ladder against the cross, one of them climbs the ladder and nails a sign on the cross above Christ's head. The crowd draws closer to see what has been written, and what do they read? Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. At last, the soldiers finish their work. Jesus is nailed to the cross. He hangs before the crowd, suffering intense pain, waiting to die. Those who watch begin to shout insults at the dying Christ. Jesus listens, but says nothing. Then suddenly, there is quiet on Calvary. Someone is making her way toward the cross. The crowd steps aside. It is Christ's mother who comes to the crowd and moves towards her dying son. With her are the faithful apostle John and some women. The brave mother looks up at Jesus. Her heart is breaking and her eyes swim with tears. The torn, bleeding, dying man on the cross is her son. Mary remembers the night long ago at Bethlehem, the night when Jesus was born in a cave. In that cave, Mary kissed her son for the first time. Now the infant of Bethlehem is a man and dying on the cross. But Mary remembers the first time she took the infant Jesus to the temple, how she had met an old prophet who warned her that one day a sword would pierce her heart. Now Mary knows what the prophet meant. Standing here beneath her son's cross, she feels the sharp sword of sorrow cutting into her heart. The joys of the cave are gone, and also the joys of Nazareth. Today on Calvary, Mary shares with her son the sorrows of the cross. Again the silence is broken. The crowd becomes restless and noisy. Many laugh and sneer at Christ. You saved others, they shout at Christ. Why don't you save yourself? Jesus listens, but he does not answer. Now they shout again. If you are Christ, why don't you come down from the cross? Mary bows her head in grief. She knows that Jesus will not come down from the cross. He could come down. This would be easy, very easy for him to do. But today, Mary knows her son must stay on the cross. End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of God Died at Three O'Clock by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese。The Thief 
At noon, the sun is usually high in the heavens, filling the world with its glorious light. But today, black, angry-looking clouds are gathering before the face of the sun, and it is becoming very dark. A few moments ago, the world was bright and clear, but now on Calvary, at noon, it is as dark as night. Is this darkness a sign of God's anger? Is God displeased at what has happened here on Calvary? Many faces among the crowd begin to show fear. Through the strange darkness, some bold voices still shout and jeer at the crucified Christ. Others, not so bold any more, cast worried glances at the man on the cross. Others, more frightened, turn away and hurry back to the city. They will not wait for the end. What if Christ's death is a mistake? This thought worries some, but not Caiaphas. He planned this death of Christ on the cross. Now he is satisfied with his evil victory over Jesus. Caiaphas believes that the cross has put an end to the friend of sinners. Never again will Christ forgive sinners. But Caiaphas is wrong. Even as he hangs dying on the cross, Jesus is thinking about sinners. Two sinners who hang on crosses on either side of him. These men are robbers and thieves. They, too, are dying. They are being punished for their many crimes. The thief on the left is bitter and hates the world. He hates the Roman soldiers and the people who stand looking at him. He has heard about Christ, and he hates him, too. The shouts of the crowd increase his anger, until finally he can stand it no longer. Turning his head toward Jesus, this angry thief joins the crowd. If you are Christ, he yells, save yourself and save us. Jesus hears the threat and does not answer. He pities the man on his left and begs his father to forgive him. The thief on the right is suffering too, but he knows that he deserves to suffer. He is paying the price for a life of crime. He knows that Jesus is innocent, and he admires him for his patience. He wonders why Jesus does not complain. Suddenly, the thief on the right thinks about his own crimes. He is sorry for the past, and wonders whether it is too late. Is it too late to ask forgiveness? Is it too late to ask for mercy? Will God forgive him? Will Christ show his mercy? There is no time to lose. He decides to try. Lord, begs the thief on the right, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It is a prayer of faith, a prayer of hope, a prayer of love, a prayer for mercy. Jesus hears the prayer, and from the cross he gives the answer, This day you shall be with me in paradise. It is now early afternoon. Many have left Calvary and have returned to their homes. For them the excitement is over. But there are some who still remain on the hill. They stand about in groups, waiting. No longer do they cry out against Christ, because Jesus refuses to answer their insults. Through his swollen eyes, Jesus looks at the figures before him, the soldiers, the guards, the people. Once he was a hero to these people, once he was their friend. He cured their sick, taught them, forgave them. Now he is dying, but they do not care. He is dying for them, but they do not know it. Jesus thinks, too, about another friend, the apostle Peter, the friend who promised to be faithful to the end. Where is Peter? He is not here. He has run away. But at the foot of his cross, the eyes of Christ find friends who have not run away. His mother, John, the apostle, Mary of Cleophas, Mary Magdalene. These friends are suffering, too, but they suffer silently. Their loyal hearts, Jesus knows, will stay with him until the end. When he is dead, their kind hands will receive his body from the cross and prepare it for burial. Looks of love and faith speak silently to Christ from the faces of his mother and the apostles. His tired eyes rest helplessly on Mary and John. He remembers his boyhood days with Mary at Nazareth. He remembers the day when John first came running after him. Today has been a hard day for Mary and John. The dark hours of this Friday afternoon have caused great suffering to these hearts who love him so much. The time has come now for Christ to say goodbye to his mother and the apostle. His strength is failing rapidly. 
but what is left he will use to speak encouragement to the two sad figures standing before him. Mary listens as her son moves his swollen lips. Woman, he says, behold thy son. She knows he means John. Then Jesus speaks to the apostle, behold thy mother. Mary turns to John, and the apostle smiles. Neither speaks, but both understand. Christ gives his mother into John's protection and care. To his mother, Christ gives John. Mary is John's mother now, and not John's alone, but the mother of all those who will love Christ as John loves him. In the darkness of Calvary, the sinless Christ gives a stainless gift. He gives the world what he loves most, his mother. Mary is now the mother of men. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of God Died at Three O'Clock by Rev. Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Three O'Clock. It is nearly three o'clock in the afternoon. For almost three hours, Jesus has been stretched and nailed to the cross. He has lost a great amount of blood, and his body is burning with fever. He is weak from the loss of blood and the lack of food. His lips and tongue are dry, his thorn-crowned head is bowed low, but he lifts it a little in order to speak. I thirst, he cries. The man of sorrows pleads for a taste of water. A little water, this is the only thing Jesus has asked for during his long hours of suffering. One of the crowd, seeing a sponge on the ground, picks it up and dips it in a jar of wine. He places the sponge on a stick and holds the sponge to the lips of Christ. Jesus sips the wine. It is sour and tastes like vinegar. It is not what he wants, but he does not refuse it. At least, the wine will moisten his dry lips. For some minutes, Jesus is silent. He is thinking. Men may think that I have been a failure, but I have not failed. I have done what my Father wished me to do. My work is done. It is finished he says aloud. The crowd does not understand. However, no one asks any questions. No one asks Christ to explain. Those standing nearby feel that the words are not important. But the words are important to Christ. He is telling the world that he has not failed. This death on the cross spells victory over sin. Today, the gates of heaven, closed so long to sinful men, will swing open once again. The price of opening heaven's gates is Christ's blood, the blood that now drops on the ground of Calvary. The apostle John, looking up at the cross, knows that Jesus will not live much longer. He holds Mary closely and does not speak. There is silence on Calvary. The two robbers on crosses next to Christ are both dead. The weakened Christ still lives. Those who watch wonder how he can defy death so long. It is the dying Christ who finally breaks the tense stillness around the cross. Though almost dead, he speaks with a loud voice. Father, he prays, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then bowing his head, Jesus dies. It is three o'clock. Jesus is dead, but the soldiers must make sure. They want to be certain that Jesus is dead. One of them taking his spear, strikes Jesus on the left side through the heart. Blood and water flow from the wound, and the heart of Christ is seen for the first time. Little does the soldier know what he has done for the world. He has shown the world the heart of Christ. From this open heart, God's love will burst over the whole world and warm the cold hearts of men. The death of Jesus brings confusion to Calvary. There is a mighty uproar. The earth shakes. Rocks split in pieces, and deep holes appear on the sides of the hill. There is thunder and lightning in the heavens, and nature cries out against the men who have nailed Christ to the cross. People are terrified, and they scream and yell with fear. Many run away and try to hide. Even the dead leave their graves and come back to life. Is this the end of the world? No, this is not the end of the world. This is the beginning of a new world. A new world where men can know God again, 
where they can find God's love again, where sinners will be given another chance. All this Christ has won on the cross. The gates of heaven, like Christ's heart, are open. Still standing at the cross are Christ's faithful mother, John, and the other two Marys. Now they have work to do. Joseph of Arimathea, a secret friend of Christ, has gone to ask Pilate's permission to take the body down from the cross. Close to Calvary is a new tomb. There Christ's friends plan to bury his body. Though Christ is dead, Pilate's soldiers remain at Calvary to guard his body. The darkness and thunder have frightened these Romans. Looking at the dead figure on the cross, they remember how they mocked and jeered this Christ only a few hours ago. Now they stand reverently and whisper to one another, This was the Son of God. This was the Son of God. But God is dead on the cross, and it is three o'clock. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of God Died at Three O'Clock》by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Emmaus. It is the Sunday after Christ's death, and two men walk along a lonely road outside Jerusalem. The men have been in the city celebrating the feast of the Passover. Leaving the city, they are now on their way to the village of Emmaus. The men are going home. Both men are sad and disappointed. As they walk along, the terrible happenings of Friday are uppermost in their minds. They talk about Christ, their friend, his sufferings and his cruel death. They know that Jesus does not deserve such treatment from his enemies. Many times they heard Christ preach. They saw his miracles. They believed in Christ and they loved him. But now he is dead. Three days have passed since Christ was placed in the tomb. Some distance from the city, the men become tired and walk more slowly. Suddenly, they stop and turn quickly. A stranger is coming down the road close behind them. Who is this man who walks alone? They wonder. Where is he going? The stranger smiles and greets the men with a question. What were you talking about as you walked along, and why are you sad? Both men are surprised. Does not this stranger know what happened in Jerusalem? Has he not heard about Friday? Does he not know that Christ is dead? One of the men, named Cleophas, asks, Are you the only one who does not know the things that have happened in Jerusalem? What things? The stranger answers, and he seems anxious to hear. As the three men make their way toward Emmaus, Cleophas does most of the talking. He tells the stranger about the great teacher of Nazareth, his work among the Jews, his teachings and acts of kindness, his miracles. The stranger is a good listener. He is interested in every word. Now and then he nods his head, as if to encourage Cleophas to continue. The stranger seems very eager to hear everything about the great man of Galilee. Cleophas is only too anxious to tell the whole story. He knows that Christ has been treated unjustly. For his kind deeds, his words of comfort, what was Christ's reward? It hurts Cleophas to speak the truth, but an injustice has been done to his best friend. At this point the stranger turns and looks at his two companions. Their eyes are sad. They are worried. Both of them are thinking about the same thing. How could men be so cruel? Tell the rest of the story, urges the stranger. What was Christ's reward? Cleophas speaks slowly, and there is a quiver in his voice. What was Christ's reward? Our chief priests and our rulers sentenced him to death. On Friday they crucified him. They nailed him to a cross. For several minutes no one speaks. The three men are thinking. It is Cleophas who breaks the silence. He is excited now and speaks quickly. Early this morning, he says, a strange thing happened. Two women went to Christ's tomb to anoint his body. When they reached the tomb, they were surprised to find the stone rolled back from the doorway. The women entered the tomb, but the body of Christ was not there. Instead, an angel dressed in white sat in the tomb, alone. Don't be afraid, said the angel. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He has risen from the dead. He is not here. We heard also, 
interrupts the companion of Cleophas, that others went to the tomb, and they too found it empty. Now it is the stranger's turn to talk. Why should Cleophas and his friend be so disappointed because Christ has been put to death? Do they not remember, asked the stranger, what the prophets of old had foretold about Christ? Did not the prophets say that Christ must be a man of sorrows, that he must die a cruel death before returning to heaven? As the stranger talks, the hearts of the other two men burn with a new hope. Maybe all is not over yet. It is late afternoon as the three men draw near the village of Emmaus. Cleophas and his friend are tired, but they will soon be home. They are surprised, however, that the stranger does not intend to stop. Stay with us, they urge the stranger, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now far spent. The invitation is sincere, and in answer the stranger nods his head. He will stay with his friends. The stranger will remain at Emmaus. It is early evening when the three men sit at table for their meal, the stranger, Cleophas, and his companion. It is good to rest, to talk, to eat, when the company is friendly and agreeable. During the meal the stranger takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives the bread to Cleophas and his companion. All at once there is silence. The men of Emmaus are startled and stunned. Their eyes flash, and they both remember. Jesus did the same thing at the Last Supper. Is it possible? Is it true? For a moment the men stare at the stranger, who smiles. Yes, yes, it is true. The stranger is Jesus Christ. He is risen from the dead. Cleophas turns to his companion, who nods his head. Then both men stare again. But Jesus is not there. He is not at the table. Jesus has disappeared. On this Sunday night there are two happy hearts in the village of Emmaus, happy because they have seen the Lord. Quickly the two men leave Emmaus. They hurry back to Jerusalem. They hasten to tell the apostles the great news. He is risen. End of chapter 14 End of God Died at Three O'Clock by Reverend Gerald T. Brennan